I'm Zoe Johnson, and I'm a senior in Girl Scouts, and I'm working on my Gold Award project, which is the highest award that a Girl Scout can earn, um, and it's for community service. And so I wanted to choose something that I was really passionate about, and I've been riding horses for 10 years, and the first horse that I ever rode was at a summer camp. So um, that really had a big impact on my life, and I know that it can really impact a lot of other people from a young age. Um, so I really wanted to help out, especially summer camps for younger kids, um, in trying to help the staff become more well-trained in horse care and safety. So I decided to make a manual and some uh, video content to pair with it, just to educate people on proper horse care and safety so that horses can be well uh, taken care of and people can be nice and safe around them. So the first thing that every horse person needs to know <laughs> is how to approach a horse safely. So I mean, obviously he's very friendly, but uh, for any horse, you want to announce that you're here. So even just talking, hey horse, <laughs> them and then kind of just give them a scratch and then you're ready to put the halter on. So this is a rope halter. Um, some people prefer, the, prefer these. Um, so I'll just teach you how to tie this really quick. So you put your uh, muzzle in the bottom, slide that over the top. Okay and then you go down through the loop behind and then you go behind the halter and then back through that so that it points away from their face and it's not poking them in the eye. Okay, and then the second type of halter is a little bit more common and a lot easier to do. So you're gonna again just like put the lead rope over to the shoulder so you can catch them if they were to run away. Yeah. And then once again, put it over the snout. nice and tight so that's not too far down the nose. So once you have your halter on your horse then you want to make sure that you have the right amount of lead rope to, <laughs> to lead them to where you want to tie them up. So you want to have enough as you're leading them for them to be able to move their head back and forth but not so much that it's dangling and their feet can get caught in it. Um, and so if you have extra lead rope then you can fold it back and forth in the other hand to hold on to it but you never want to wrap it like that because then if they pull back, then they can tighten and break some of your bones in your hand. So, we'll just lean them over here. So now we're ready to tie them up to be able to groom and tack up. So I'm making sure that it's high enough um, so that it's probably at his chest level. It's no lower than probably at the bottom of his neck. Um, and then I'm going to do about an arm's length at, length at the most between his halter and the post so that it doesn't get tangled in his feet paws or kicks or anything. So then to tie the knot, you want it to be a quick release knot so that you can pull the end if he starts freaking out or anything and it'll just release him. And so I'm going to cross it over like this and to form like a four. And then you're going to twist that, bring the loose end through that hole, pull it tight. That's your basic quick release. So you can pull it out. Okay. Then you can like double it back if they are smart enough that they'll pull themselves out. So it's important to find a sturdy place to tie them, so not on the sideways boards, especially like a fence, um, because those, if they pull back or they rear up or anything, then they can pull the whole fence rail off, and so it can smack them in the face, they can go get themselves really hurt. So a sturdy vertical fence post is good, or a hitching rail that's specifically for horses. Um, or cross ties. And so for cross ties, it's a little bit different because they're going to clip onto either side here of the halter. And so you have um, two posts or opposite sides of walls um, with different like lead lines like this. And so they should be long enough to just meet in the middle um, if they weren't attached to a halter. So you just attach them here and then they should always have some kind of a quick release snap or a um, safety like strap they make them for especially cross ties uh, just so that you don't end up having a freaking out horse that can't get released so. the next step once you have them tied up and you're trying to get ready to tack up for riding is to groom them first um, so you want to make sure that you get all of the dirt off from the saddle area particularly so up here where the saddle would go all the way back to where the saddle would stop and then make sure that you get under where the girth is 
because any friction that they have with the girth, if there's any dirt under there, it can rub them and irritate the skin. So you're going to do that on both sides. And then it's really important to pick the hooves out um, because if there's any rocks, like there's gravel here, then that can really hurt their hooves. So you're just going to pick that out. You're going to avoid the frog, which is like this middle triangle part. Um, and just kind of scrape that all out. It doesn't have to be perfectly clean, but I can see there's no rocks in there. Put that down. And then the back side, I'm still facing parallel with the horse, so directly behind them. And then just placing their back leg on their on my thigh like that. And then there's nothing really to pick out here. And then I'll let it down. There you go. And then fly spray is another really important thing, um, especially in the summer and in places with a lot of insects, because you can see they're really annoying him right now. Um, so mostly on the legs, just kind of squirt it, and then on the neck and chest. Um, you want to avoid where the saddle would be, because um, on some horses it can irritate the skin, and there's not going to be flies on the saddle anyway. So. Just kind of up on the butt, a little bit over there, okay. Um, and then for the eyes, you're going to want to get a rag spray a little bit on there, and then just rub around the eyes, like that. Because um, if you, obviously if you spray it, it'll get in their eyes. Um, so when you want to do the other side, the same way, um, in order to walk around a horse, you're going to put your hand on the croup so that they know that you're there, and then just walk directly behind them. Because if you're, the closer you are, the less momentum their legs can have, and so it doesn't hurt as much if they kick you. Um, rather than if you walk like this far behind them, A, they don't know that you're there, and B, if they kicked, then they're going to have full force. Um, or you can go all the way back here where the legs can't hit you and just move all the way over there and make a huge circle. So. The next step is to actually tack up. So I have my western saddle here first. Um, so you're just going to put the blanket on. And put it on way far forward first so you can kind of get it even and then slide it back. And you want to make it, I mean this one's really big, so it can cover all the way down to the shoulder and way down to here to the hip. And you have to all that on the other side. Okay, and then we have to decide where to position the saddle. So first I'm going to pull this blanket away from his withers. See, so it gives him room to move. Um, and then we're going to decide, so the saddle and his shoulder blade is kind of under the saddle. So I'll move it back just a little bit. Just give his shoulder room. Because it shouldn't be on the saddle, or it shouldn't be on the shoulder. It should just be right behind it. Um, I mean, it can be as far as four inches behind. It just depends on how long the saddle is. Because you want to make sure that the saddle itself um, doesn't rest on his loins, which is um, his like lumbar vertebrae. So that's after his last rib, um, which is like here ish. Kind of depends on each horse. Um, so the skirt right here isn't putting any weight on him, it's kind of just for decoration. So that can be on his lumbar, that's okay. It's really just the seat where the pressure is. Alright, so now that I have everything untangled, we're going to put on the girth so it doesn't slide around. So the girth should be about four fingers or a hand past the front leg. So for a western, just gonna stick the end down and through. And you don't really want to make it tight quite yet. No, oh, it's kind of sliding out a little bit. It's okay. Okay, and then down through the first one. over and then up to the second okay then this is where you start to tighten it so it's right really loose right now and so you want it to be pretty tight so I'm just gonna slide it up a little bit like that pull up the slack and keep feeling it so you should be able to fit four fingers pretty snugly so that's a little bit loose but um, as you ride a little bit you can tighten it further so then to just store the slack 
I'm gonna tighten that down here. And then to store that, stick it up and it hangs like that. So when the stirrup comes down, it looks pretty much like that. And the rear cinch really isn't that tight. It just keeps the back of the saddle from flipping up as they move. So it just has to be kind of snug. So right there, it's really the tightest that I would want it because when you breathe, it gets tighter. So if I was gonna ride in this, I would loosen it down, maybe even make another hole with a leather hole punch. But that'll be fine for now. So now we'll move on to the breast collar. So, okay, so this breast collar just attaches um, to the two D rings on the saddle, right here on the front. So there's an identical one on the other side, which it's already attached to. So it, it kind of just depends on your style of breast collar if you choose one. You don't always have to have one. It just keeps the saddle in place and from like tilting too much left or right or sliding too much backwards, especially if you're going up and down hills. So this is a little bit loose for him, um, but again, I'm not going to be riding the saddle. So I would tighten it a little bit. So it's here, but not really snug. You want to have enough room, but just enough so it doesn't fall down like that. So then you're gonna attach this to the ring in this inch, like that. So this is actually probably pretty okay. It's just a little bit low because you really want it to be up here. So this is kind of our solution to that problem. Um, some breastplates just have this already um, made into the breast collar. It just depends on what kind you buy. So I just looped it onto this kind of ring on the other side put it where I want it, tighten that up a little bit, and then I'll just tie it onto this ring. Um, and this isn't perfect because it might wear on and button right there, you just have to be kind of careful with that. So I'd suggest just getting a breast collar that really works with yours. Um, but again, I don't really ride in this western saddle, so it's not really a big deal, this is just for demonstration purposes. So that's kind of the position that you would want it in. This is probably for a bigger horse, so that's why. Um, and then you can also have a crouper, but this saddle doesn't have a big D-ring back here to attach one. But usually they'll have a D-ring right here or on the skirt somewhere. And so that'll just come down here with one strap, split into two, go around the bottom of the tail. So you'll just kind of lift that up a little bit, stick it under and through, and then just clip it on here. Um, yeah, I think that's it for the western saddle. So here's for my English riders right here. Um, this is what I usually ride them in, so this saddle fits a little bit better for my horse. So again, I'm just putting on the saddle pad, and this one's obviously a lot smaller, um, so it has to be a little bit more accurate to where you want it. <laughs> Alright, so again, it's like past the shoulder, if the shoulder ends here, eh, that's about three fingers, which is good. So then I'll just toss the saddle over. Make sure his hair's out of the way. Alright, and so this one's centered on the spine. Um, so that's all good. And then this one, there's just one girth. Attach. And you want the sides to be pretty much even on the girth. So if this one I'm attaching to the third, then on the other side, it's pretty much the third as well. It would be the fourth or something. Um, but it, it would be an issue if it's like, I don't know, the sixth and the third, because then the uh, girth is off center, so it'll wear kind of funny. So that's about four fingers, snugly. And again, I can always tighten it later. You don't want to make it too tight so that they feel like they can't breathe or anything like that. Um, yeah, so it's a lot simpler. So now I'll just go over like tack fit in general. So this also applies largely to the Western saddle, um, but this one's a bit easier to just show. Um, so, first of all, if you're trying to decide whether a saddle will fit your horse, um, you're going to look at the channel here, has to be off of the spine. Um, I mean, about two inches-ish, I mean it can be more, but if it's on the spine, then it's going to uh, restrict their movement too much. So the panels have to be on, on either side of the spine, so that goes for like if they're, um, if the panels are too close together, and then they kind of are on, putting pressure on the spine. 
that's not going to be good for their movement and it's not going to make them feel comfortable. So when you put it on, the channel gets room underneath the panels on the far end of the side. And when I press down, you can feel down the panels and it distributes fairly even pressure. And to make this a little clearer if you're feeling it, you can take off the saddle pad first, just put it on and feel, press down and feel the panels and see if there are any spots that's uh, popping up or like putting more pressure on because that's going to be uncomfortable for them. And you also want to look at when it's on your, on your horse that the seat is pretty parallel to the ground. Um, I mean the ground is kind of tilted right now so hard to tell-ish, but you can go onto a flatter surface and just see that the saddle is level um, and if it's not then you'll have to adjust it to fit more accurately. So once you have the saddle on, then you're going to do the bridle. So this is just a pretty standard English bridle. Um, it's just a snaffle and a nose band. So I'll go over the difference between a snaffle bit and a leverage or a curb bit a little bit later. Um, but I would recommend if you're trying to figure out what kind of bit to use, um, you know, between different varieties of snaffle bits or <laughs> leverage bits, <laughs> Uh, there's just so many options that you should probably just talk to someone who knows your horse or another horse professional that you can just ask specifics about um, because there's so many different types of shapes and sizes of <laughs> uh, of rings and cheek pieces and like different mouthpiece materials and shapes and so many things. So I can't cover all of that, but here's how to put on a halter or how to put on a bridle at least. So you're going to take off the bridle first, or oh my gosh, you're going to take off the halter um, and some people choose to put it around the neck like this. Um, I personally don't really like that because if they scoop, then they're gonna go running off in that direction and if, or rearing or bucking or whatever. And so if they have a halter around their neck here, then they can really hurt themselves and do some bad damage. So I just take it off and have the reins over my head or over his head. Um, and so now to put on the bit, you're just gonna kind of put it in your hand like that and kind of guide it to his mouth. And then I'm taking my thumb right into the corner of his mouth, so it's this corner right there, and just kind of sticking it in, my, in his mouth. Sometimes you have to kind of rub their gums. They don't have any teeth right there, so you're not going to get bitten. Um, so you don't have to, you know, dig in or hurt them at all. Just kind of rub them, tickle them on their lips, and they'll open their mouth. All right, and so then right there I just took out the hair that was caught. And then this is the brow band. Sometimes it's just around one ear, just depends on the halter. <laughs> and so this one's pretty big. You just want to make sure that it's not so tight that it bends the side pieces right there out of place. So then this is the nose band. And there are some different types of nose bands too. Really, you only need nose bands for snaffle bits, which is this type of bit. And so this is a drop nose band. So you can tell because there's a little ring right here. See where if you have it loose, this part just drops. So that's a drop nose band. And so this one goes a little bit lower than the other type, main type, that's the cavalson. So this should go about a hand over the top of their nostril. And then you're gonna want to be able to definitely put two fingers in, maybe more. If it's a little bit loose, that's okay. Um, and so that just keeps the bit in place and keeps them from opening, opening their mouth so much that the bit is not effective. So a cavison, I don't really have one, but it would go more up here. Um, so you want to make sure that it goes up on the hard part of their nose rather than like the soft part down here. Because if you put it down here, it can close their airway because the cavison is tighter. So it's going to go more up here and then it'll be tight enough that it's quite snug and you can put that one finger in there and it's going to go under the cheek pieces so right here and then just tighten on the back um, and that also just keeps their mouth closed um, and that's a little bit more common and so you don't need uh, nose bands for leverage bits which are also curb bits um, because it just interferes with the way that the bit moves um, and it's not necessary for those so first of all, I'll just go over the snaffle bit, and this one is commonly used for beginners and a lot of English riders. 
um, because it's pretty simple in the fact that, um, you know, an ounce of pressure um, f- from the reins equals an ounce of pressure in the horse's mouth. So it's pretty um, just linear like that. There's no leverage aspect. So there are different parts of the bit as labeled in the picture. So the joints, there can be a varying number of joints, usually just one or two in a bit. And then the rings can be in different shapes and sizes. And so there's so many options and it's kind of complicated about which ones you should use for different horses and different um, aspects of riding. So I would recommend just finding a horse professional that can recommend one for your specific circumstances. Um because there are just so many options and so many factors. But in general, if you're trying to find what bit you should try out for your horse, um, you can keep in mind a few rules rules of thumb. So first of all is the diameter of the mouthpiece, which is the bars and the joint, um, which goes in the horse's mouth. So that mouthpiece's diameter affects how um, sharp or like um, subtle it feels in the horse's mouth. So in general, you would start with a um, like thicker diameter of mouthpiece, and then if that isn't working out, then you can always go a little bit thinner. Um, but you don't want to start thin and then accidentally hurt your horse's mouth because it's really sensitive. Um, so just start thicker, and you can always work your way up a little bit th- thinner as time goes on. Um, and then the mouthpiece should be about um, as as long as the horse's mouth plus roughly a quarter of an inch on each side so that you can see the ends of the bit um, on both sides of the horse. The second main type of bit is called a leverage bit or a curb bit. There's just two names for the same thing. And so these are more commonly used in Western riding, although some Western riders use a simple snaffle bit as well. So it really just depends on your horse and what kind of riding you're going to do. And these are a little bit more complicated than the snaffle bit is because there's some leverage happening because you put the the reins attached to the bottom ring that you can see um, on the picture. And so as you pull back on the reins, the bit kind of rotates. And so then that port that you can see labeled as the bump, um, that will kind of move against the horse's top of their mouth. And so it adds some extra pressure. So it's not anymore just an ounce, an ounce of pressure equals an ounce of pressure in their mouth it's a little there's a little more for less that you do with your reins so it's a little bit harder for beginners to ride with so I'd recommend a more experienced rider to use these and as you can see it's a little bit more complicated in the fact that there's a lot of different elements to take into account when you're trying to figure out what kind of um, bit to choose for your horse and so once again I would recommend trying to find a professional that can just help you figure out where to start and which bits to try to use first because there are just a lot of factors to take into account but again there are a few rules of thumb that are kind of similar to the snaffle bit um it can just help you guide guide you to a starting point so first of all again the diameter of the mouthpiece is still a factor um so again the thinner the diameter of the mouthpiece the more harsh it's going to be in the horse's mouth Um, but in addition to that on the mouthpiece the port um, how how big that is. So the port is the little bump that you see. Um, so a smaller port will have less of an impact on the horse. So it's going to be softer in the horse's mouth. And a more severe port that's steeper and just a bigger bump will be have more of an impact on the horse. And then you can look at the shanks that you can see labeled. And so if they're more curved towards the horse's chest then they're going to be more mild of a bit because it's going to be less pressure on the horse's mouth. And so then the, also the length of the shank is also influential because the longer the shank is, the more leverage it's going to put on the horse's mouth. And so um, longer shanks will be more severe in the horse's mouth. And so shorter shanks um, will be more mild. And so no matter what kind of bit that you have, uh, it needs to be the right position in the horse's mouth. So you can tighten or loosen the cheek straps on the side of the bridle to make the, um, the bit farther back in the horse's mouth or further to the front. And so in general, the rule of thumb is to have two wrinkles in the horse's 
cheek caused by the bit, as you can see in the picture, but it really should just be right in front of the molar, wherever that is on your horse. Okay, so the next section that's really important for any horse owner or horse caretaker to know um, is how to take their vitals. So it's really important to know how to take vitals so that you can tell when your horse is sick um, and have something to compare to um, and make sure that you know what their normal levels are because each horse is different. So their normal resting heart rate, um, their normal temperature, things like that, um, so that when they do look a little bit off, then you can measure the vitals and compare it to their normal and then let a vet know if it's serious. So the first thing is a temperature. Um, just like humans, it's great to know what their temperature is. Um, because if they're sick, then obviously they can, they can run a fever and that can be serious. So unfortunately there aren't oral thermometers for horses. You have to use a rectal one. So you're gonna just kind of stand by their hind end, let, it, let them know that you're here. Um, stand next to their hind feet, not behind them, um, just so you don't get kicked. And then you're gonna kind of just move the tail away. And then you're gonna wanna put water or Vaseline on there first, and then just kind of slide it in. And then you're gonna have to hold that there. <laughs> I know, that's why you stand next to them. Um, for about a minute, or the digital ones will be. I know. So this is why you wanna practice, because again, he's not sick right now, but if he was sick, then this would be kind of a pain to do. Um, so we just have to practice that more often. Um, but it's really nice to have a string on there, just so you can keep a good hold on it. Um, yeah. Okay, so the next thing is taking their pulse. Um, that's another really good one to know. Um, it's a little bit harder to perfect be able to tell what their pulse is. Um, and there's a lot of varieties of ways to take to go about this. So I would recommend just practicing on a healthy horse. Um, just like trying to read the temperature. It's a little bit weird for them, um, and it's quite hard for people to do too sometimes. Um, so there's a few ways. First of all, if you have a stethoscope, that's really helpful because you can just go right here next to their um, shoulder right here, their elbow, uh, and then you can just listen and you can hear the heart. Um, and so then you just count for 15 seconds or 30 seconds and then just multiply um, by four for 15 seconds or by two if you do 30 seconds. And um, then you know how many beats per minute. Um, but if you don't have a stethoscope, then there's a few different places that you can try to feel their pulse. So the first one is right by their eye. And this can be kind of hard. You have to just find the vein. And then you can kind of feel it if you just put light pressure. But it can be kind of hard because their blinking can kind of throw you off. Um, there's another one right over here. If you just put light pressure. It takes some time to figure out where it is on your horse. Um, but it should be pretty much just where their neck meets their chest. Um, another one is by their fetlock, so that's right over here, and it's just, oh boy, this is hard because sometimes they'll just lift their foot up, which is why I don't do it with him, but some people like just feeling it right on their fetlock, but again, it just depends on what your horse is comfortable with and what you find the easiest, um, but those are just three options, um, there's another one right here if you go by their jawbone on the inside and then you kind of there should be a vein that if you roll your fingers kind of towards like this direction then you'll find it but again it's kind of hard and you don't want to push too hard because then you won't be, you won't be able to feel it so it's just the right amount of pressure and so you should just practice and find a good spot for you all right so another vital measurement that you should do is how to measure their breath rate. So you can first of all just kind of listen to their breath sounds um, and so he's not raspy or sounding unusual, um, just kind of a normal breathing sound. Um, and then to get their breaths per minute, um, once again you can just set a timer for 15 seconds or 30 seconds and then just multiply either by four or by two um, to get the breaths per minute. And so what you're gonna look for is just you can see oh wait. Um, so you can just see when his stomach just goes in and out. So you're either going to count when they go out or when it goes in. Just one of the two. So you can see one and it goes out, and then two it goes out, and then three. So you're just going to continue measuring. Um, just count those for 15 seconds or 30 seconds, and that's it. So just continue on measuring vitals. 
Um, another really important one is in their mouth. So you should be able to just see their gums. So here, it's a pink color. Um, it shouldn't be too light. It all just depends on the horse, so you should know what they look like normally to be able to compare them. And so then you should be able to measure their capillary refill time. So you just press for a little bit and then let go and it should return to its pink color after one to two seconds. Um, so it should be pretty instant. It goes white and then when you release it returns back to pink. Um, so then there are a few other ones that you can see pretty easily. Um, just vital measurements that aren't really measurements, they're just observations. So for instance, if their behavior is off, like if they usually come to the gate right away when you walk in, and then all of a sudden they're just standing in the corner, kind of just standing there weirdly, then that's abnormal behavior and that's important to notice. Um, another is if they're lame. So when you walk them, if they're starting to limp or just put more weight on one foot, um, like here he's just standing, he's relaxed and that's okay. Um, just with one foot up like that. And that's right, but if he does that all the time, like as soon as he stops, he just puts one foot up, that would be an issue. Um, especially if he's starting to like limp or like walk kind of unevenly, that's lameness. Even if he can still walk, it's still lame. Um, another one is just appetite. So if he's not eating as much, um, that could be an issue with his mouth or um, other issues that make him lose his appetite, just like humans. Um, <laughs> and then the last one is just like manure and urine. So I mean, the urine should be uh, just a wheat color, pretty clear. Um, and so sometimes people get freaked out, especially in the winter, if it, uh, if, if, if he's outside and it's snowy, then like you can see where he did urinate. It could sometimes kind of be an orangey reddish color, which is kind of concerning when you see it. But actually, that's just the oxy oxygenation. So it's okay if it comes if it comes out in a stream of yellow, but then it kind of oxygenates and it turns orangish or reddish, and that's totally fine. Um, and so then your uh, so then manure should be eight to twelve piles a day in general. Okay, so another really important thing to know how to do is to measure a horse's weight. Um, that's really important because you'll need to know that for giving medications, like especially um, giving dewormer medications, um, which you have to give usually twice a year. It kind of depends on where you are and what kind of horse you have. Um, and I go into that a little bit more in detail with my manual, so just go reference that if you want. Um, so to figure out the weight of your horse, um, you can get some like horse-specific um, weight tapes, which are kind of like measuring tapes, but they'll just give you the, the kind of estimate your horse's uh, weight just based on like their girth right here. So you just run the weight tape all the way around, try to keep it parallel, parallel to like their shoulder, just perpendicular to the ground. Um, and it'll kind of es estimate it, but it's not very exact. So a little bit better is to um, use a measuring tape. So it's just a normal one um, in inches. And so you're just gonna wrap it around right over the withers. And then make sure it's not twisted and just go right here. So it's a little bit too short here, but I'll just put it here. estimation. It's not always exactly, but it's a little bit better than the weight tape. Um, that way you don't have to buy one. So I think that happens a lot with horses is they get minor cuts and scrapes. Um, it just, they seem to get into trouble with, even if your fencing is perfect and it seems like everything is super safe, they always find a way to get themselves cut up. Um, so with minor scrapes that are just kind of surface layer, they might break the skin a little bit or just rub off the hair. Um, so for that, you just really want to clean out the wound with just so water, just like a hose, hose it off gently. Um, and then usually you don't have to put ointment on those surface um, injuries. Um, you can just keep them clean and don't put ointment on it because it'll attract dirt in. So just monitor it. If it starts getting infected, then you might have to call a vet. And so for a little bit deeper cuts, 
you'll have to um, put some cream on it usually. So if they're kind of deep, then um, you can just, I mean, stop the bleeding first. If it bleeds a lot, you have to call a vet. Um, if you can't stop it with some moderate pressure for just a few minutes, if it keeps going, then you have to call a vet. But for most injuries, you can just stop it with some gauze pressure, and then you just change the gauze uh, about two times a day, and you can put some antibiotic ointment or just even like Vaseline on there, put some gauze on it, and then vet wrap it, especially if it's on the legs. Sometimes it's in areas that you can't vet, vet wrap it and you have to be a little bit more creative, but you can always ask your vet for some advice on that. Um, so the one really big thing that some people might not know is that puncture wounds are can be really serious. Um, so you don't really know how far in they go. Um, so it's hard to tell if they're infected and it's hard to tell how clean they are on the inside. So really for any puncture wound, even, it look, if, it, even if it looks pretty small, you should really call a vet. Um, and then they can flush it out and make sure that everything is all good to go. <laughs> um, yeah, so in general, just try to keep it clean. If anything gets infected, then make sure to call your vet. Um, and they'll be happy to help you out on that. Thank you so much for watching. And if you want any of the information that we went over in the video, plus a lot that I didn't get the chance to cover, um, just follow the link in the description of this video um, and you'll see the manual that I created for the um, Girl Scout Gold War project. Um, so it includes all the information that I went over, um, plus a ton more that's super helpful. So go check that out if you're interested. Thanks for watching.